Um, as Carl said, I uh, founded a dot com back in 1998. Um, that was before the, the phrase was even coined at a dot com. Um, what are we going to talk tonight? Uh, the T in TED stands for technology, and that's what we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about tonight. Um, specifically, I want to talk about photography. Um, we're going to talk about modern day digital photography that we all know about, and um, my beloved analog uh, wet plate collodion process. Um, I want to be honest with all of you guys, I've never considered myself a photographer. Um, I never owned a camera. Uh, I never read a book. Um, I have no formal training, um, but I find myself here in front of all of you, and it's, it's a huge honor. Um, I am self-taught. I learned by trial and error. Um, one of the things that has changed photography and our lives is the invention of cell phones. And in particular, uh, what about a cell phone um, what device on a cell phone has changed the way that we communicate. And everyone's got a cell phone. I'd ask you guys, well, who has a cell phone and who doesn't? Um, but that would be a silly question. Everyone's got a cell phone these days. Um, but with a cell phone, you get a, um, you get a digital camera. And it's that digital camera that has really changed the way that we perceive and share our lives together. Um, technology has um, given us instant gratification. We want everything now. Um, some of these older processes, and particularly the wet plate process, is it's nothing about instant. It, it takes time, it's difficult, uh, but that's the beauty of it. Um, early in the 1900s, uh, you, the only people that had cameras were professional photographers, so not everyone was walking around with a, uh, a camera at the, uh, at the end of their fingertips, and that's what's really changed here. Um, now everyone has a camera, and everyone thinks they're a photographer. I'd like to ask someone from the crowd um, to look on their cell phone and tell me how many digital photographs they have on their cell phone. What about you, young lady? I have 775. 775 uh, digital images or photographs on her cell phone. How many of those have you printed off? Very few. Very few. That's what I thought. And I've been asking this question. I have students come out um, from both colleges, and I give talks all of the time. And I've been asking them, how many of those are you printing off? And they, what I'm finding out is we're not printing off any of these photographs. Um, they're staying um, in our pockets. Um, they never see the light of day. And um, we just look at them on the screen, and we may share them on Facebook, and we may text them back and forth to each other. Um, but they never come into uh, real life. And so we have to ask ourselves, why are we taking all of these photographs? We have taken more photographs today than in the first 150 years of photography. That's today, 24 hours. We took more photographs today than in the first 150 years since photography was invented back in about 1840. Um, it was documented and uh, there was a census. We took over a trillion digital photographs last year, people. We take photographs of everything. We take photographs of our loved ones. We take photographs of our car, of our food at dinner. We take photographs of our toilets. We take photographs of <laughs> about, nothing's off limits, okay? So we're taking photographs of everything. We have to ask, ask ourselves, why are we doing that? There is actually, I'm a registered nurse also, um, and there's actually a medical, a psychological diagnosis now for people that take too many selfies. And I'm not sure if you guys are from, it's not funny. It's the truth. There, I read the article, whatever you want to believe, it's true. People that take too many selfies, there's actually a medical diagnosis for that. What we have to understand um, with digital photographs is that these photographs are not in the real world. They are nothing more than zeros and ones in a long string in a data file. Okay, they don't have, they have no weight, they have no presence, you can't touch them, you can't feel them. Um, it has been said that we're going to be the first generation of people that do not inherit a shoebox of photographs from our parents. And think about that for a moment. I mean, we all know about that. We all have, you know, grandma, grandma and grandpa pass away and we get this, um, we get this shoebox of photographs. We look back at them and we look at, back at it fondly and we think about the history and we think about the past and it's our way of remembering people. My father, my father passed away a couple years ago and anytime I see a photograph of him, it, it just brings things to me. And, um, and that's all we got left of some of these, these people. So it's really kind of important. So, um, but if we're taking all these digital photographs, um, are we leaving a physical record of our existence? Are we blindly trusting technology with our memories? If there was a fire in your house and you got everyone out, the dogs out and the families out and everyone of any importance and everyone's to safety and you had that one last minute and you could go and say, what's the one thing that I would go grab out of my house? And I would bet nine out of 10 times the person would go back for a photo album 
or that box, that shoe box of photographs, because it's important to us. So why are we trusting digital technology with our memories? There's been a heated debate in technology world about moving digital files forward. We're not just talking moving a digital file 10 years into the future, 20 years. Let's talk about moving a digital file 150 years into the future. How are we going to achieve that? Um, I'm going to show you here an original glass ambrotype. Uh, this is about 160 years old, okay? Um, and this photograph looks exactly how it did 160 years ago. So what's really beautiful, and I'll explain that to you about the wet plate process, is that things, uh, they last a long time. And, and this is a really um, important uh, concept to understand. Um, technology has a double-edged sword for us, okay? We're trusting technology here. There's two, two sides of this sword that are gonna burn all of us, okay? There's the hardware side, your USB driver, your hard drive, your disk drive that you're storing all these digital images on, it's gonna become obsolete, and there's that chance that your images are gonna be kept with that. Okay, there's the other side of that sword is the, the software side. So we have the hardware side, and then we have the software side that's going to uh, offend us. Um, as soon as a JPEG or a TIFF does not become the standard, which is how we're saving all of these digital photographs, your 700 and some photographs are in one of those formats, um, as soon as it does not become this, uh, the standard, something new comes along, a new technology comes along, and is faster and is more compressed, and just it's the newest thing, your software is gonna let you down. So there's a couple of ways that we're gonna lose our photographs. Um, I have the huge honor of having some of my wet plates actually curated by the State Historical Society. And I talk to the curators and, and the historians up there, and it's a concern for them. And they're receiving now for the first time, okay? They're receiving these digital files, um, photographs and emails and stuff like that, and they don't know how they're gonna get these 50 years into the future, okay? And if, with all their resources, the state of North Dakota, their resources, these people are trained and they went to college to do this, these archivists, if they're worried about this and with all their resources, they don't know how they're gonna do it, how are you and I gonna do it at home? The CEO of Google last year wrote an article and he talked about the forgotten century and he's warning us that all digital files, not just photographs, but emails, all correspondence, is, it's all at risk. Um, so we have to ask ourselves what has changed and what's changed is technology has changed. It's changing very, very quickly. We all know that. I own an Apple IIe computer. I bought it in 1981. I would challenge anyone in this room to go back to that computer and get one byte of information off of it. It still exists there. You could still go up to it and turn it on. It still powers on. But get, to get a file off there, it's, it's not, it, it, an expert could do it, but we're not going to be able to do it. So let's talk a little bit about my passion, okay? And my passion is wet plate collodion process. Um, um, how I learned about the process, that's what everyone first asked me, is how did you learn about this? Um, I was online and I saw a photograph and I saw a gentleman pouring some chemical onto this plate. I wasn't so interested in that, but I, was, I just fell in love with this photograph that he had taken and I, I asked him, I said, what is that? And he says, it's a wet plate. And for some reason I was just drawn to it. And I said, well, what's a wet plate? And I went, quickly went onto Google, and I searched and found out what wet plating was, and here's this 165-year-old process, and it's very archaic, and nobody does it anymore. So I, I said to Paul, it was his name, nice gentleman, I said, well, I would love to do that. And he says, well, Shane, are you a photographer? I said, well, Paul, I don't even own a camera. And he says, well, I've been a professional photographer for 30 years, and I can't figure this process out. There's no way that a non-photographer is ever gonna be able to do this. And within um, 45 days of that conversation, I made my very first wet plate. <laughs> so October 4th, 2012, my very first wet plate, my brother Chad, okay? Um, you can about imagine I jumped about five feet off the ground. I made this image of my brother out of glass, some chemicals, and some know-how that I learned from 19th century textbooks. Um, I'm the only person in North Dakota that's doing this, and there's a le less than 1,000 of us in the world. I was told by a historian that in the 1980s, we were down to six plat wet plate artists in the world. So this process was that close to maybe becoming obsolete or forgotten, just like those photographs that are on your phone. Um, I've made over 1,800 wet plates to date. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Frederick Scott Archer, is the gentleman who invented the wet plate collodion process in 1848. 
um, you have to understand wet plate was not the first photographic process, it was the, pretty much the second photographic process. The first photographic process was the daguerreotype, um, named after Daguerre the Frenchman, and what they were doing, they were taking pieces of silver and high polishing them to a glass-like finish, and they were pouring mercury on it, and they were getting some of the first photographic images, and they're just beautiful. Um, the problem with that is that it was a very pricey um, scenario. You're talking about sheets of silver. And they also, um, it was dangerous. These young photographers didn't know it, but they were heating up this mercury and they were breathing in these mercury vapors and they were getting uh, heavy metal poisoning and they were dying and losing their minds. Um, it's called Mad Hatter's Disease. In the same time, there were hatters that were making felt out of rabbit's fur and they were using mercury. So they were kind of poisoning themselves and they did not realize it. Um, so I am called an ambrotypist, and I'm very proud of that. An ambrotype is exactly what I showed you. It's a piece of glass with silver on it. And ambrotype uh, means eternal impression. Um, they a very other common, you guys may, not to confuse you with wet plate, but you may have heard of tin types. Okay, that was also a very common process. It's the same process, they just put it on tin instead of glass. I, I happen to feel my personal preference is if I ask you, do you want your image on glass or a piece of tin, you'd probably more than likely say, I'd rather have a piece of glass. Um, I think it's about the glass is fragile, you have to covet it. And I think um, the images, it's important to take care of your images. Um, so why is wet plate so special? Um, it's the first time that people, actual common people like you and me, were able to get their photographs taken. Remember, the daguerreotypes, you would have had to have been a king or a queen or some countess or something, someone with some stature or some money or finances to be able to get your photograph taken. So here we had these photographers going around in their little carts and buggies, pulling up to a town, parking their horse, getting out their, uh, their wet plate gear, putting up a sign, and people would come and bring them apples or feed their horse or put them up for the night, and it's how photographers fed themselves. What's really special about the wet plate process is um, it's archival. Um, the image is actually made out of silver, okay? So I have a silver spoon here, okay? If I toss that silver spoon on the ground and I come back 500 years from now, what's on the ground? A silver spoon. And that's the concept, and that's why this, this process is so beautiful, because I'm not thinking about to making this wet plate for tomorrow or next week or five years down the road. I'm thinking about someone looking at my work 200 years from now. Um, the other very fabulous thing about the wet plate process is a university recently did a study, and they scanned wet plates with the most high-resolution scanners we have available to us, and, and some daguerreotypes, and they found out that these, these silver-type photographs of the early 1800s right at the nano level. And what that means to you, and here we go with that T word again, technology, is that um, I, you can take a wet plate that I make and you can put it under a microscope, not a magnifying glass, a microscope, and you cannot get to the pixel or the grain that makes up that image. So when I take wet plate photographs of someone, I've taken the most high resolution image that's ever been taken of them in their life and will ever be taken of them. So how do you make a wet plate? I'm going to go into that really briefly. Um, the, the archer, I call it archer's elixir, and it's called collodion, and this is specifically called salted collodion, and this is, this is what he used. This was the technology that he used to make these photographs. Um, archer did not invent uh, collodion. Um, collodion had a medical application. If we were on, on the prairie or something, you fell off the horse and broke your arm, I would wrap a piece of cloth around your arm. I would go to my gunsmith. I would ask for some gun cotton. I'd have a bottle of ether with me. I'd put the gun cotton in the ether. I'd swish, swish it around and I would get collodion. I'd then pour it onto your, onto your arm and I'd set a cast. So it had a medical application. What Archer figured out in 1848 was if he adds bromide salts to the collodion, he can get silver ions to jump out of a silver nitrate bath and make a photosensitive plate. And that's essentially what, uh, that, that's what we do. So I pour the collodion on a glass plate, and I'm going to be demonstrating this out uh, in the foyer uh, later on tonight. So whoever wants to see a wet plate made, I will do that for you tonight. Um, I pour the collodion onto the plate. I submerge um, the plate into silver nitrate for three minutes, and then I expose it in the camera. One of the interesting and more difficult parts about the wet plate process is the exposure times. This young lady's camera, her iPhone camera, the shutter is open for 1 60th of a second, okay? It's a blink of an eye. It's less than a blink of an eye. In my studio with 4,500 watts of light on my subjects, I'm experiencing 10 seconds of exposure. So my exposure time is 600 times longer than it takes her to take a digital photograph. So it's slow. Um, 
so we'll, the next thing we do is after we expose the plate, um, we develop the plate, and then we also uh, fix the plate, which strips everything off the plate, and all we're left with is the silver. Um, incidentally, another dangerous aspect of wet plating in the 1800s was I use modern day hypo fixer, which most photographers use that use film. Um, back in the day, they would have been used potassium cyanide. Well, you know, a, a liter of potassium cyanide, if I get one drop in my eye or in my mucosa or get it in a hangnail or something, you're dead in about 15 seconds. Um, once the plate is made, we let the plate dry, and then what we have to do, this spoon that I've been litting, sitting down here for 500 years, okay, it's 500 years later, I come walking up to it, it didn't look, it doesn't look exactly how it looked when I put it there, right? What is it? It's black. It's tarnished. Oxygen has gotten to that silver and it oxidized the plate. So um, we don't want that to happen to my wet plate, so us wet plate artists, we varnish, we pour varnish over the silver and blocks out all the oxygen, and that protects it. Um, there's a story that there was two wet plates of Billy the Kid that was made. Um, one was not varnished and one was varnished. The one that was not varnished um, was lost to time and became black and unreadable. And the one that was varnished uh, sold at Sotheby's for $2.1 million about three years ago. Um, what's really difficult about the wet plate process is that the, wet, uh, the plate must stay wet all the time. So technology changed in the 1890s and they invented dry plates. And as soon as they made dry plates, wet plates was just very difficult to do and everyone went to dry plates. So wet plating was only around for about 40 years or so. As an artist, I want to talk a little bit about being an artist. As an artist, um, and I never considered myself an artist before, I'm constantly searching for that perfect plate. I'm looking for the perfect light. I'm looking for the perfect composition, taking that perfect photograph. I know in my heart, and I'm, I'm really happy for this, that I will never find that perfect plate. But it's that pursuit of that perfect plate that keeps coming, coming back. I just had a conversation this morning with a wet plate artist over in Ireland, and I said to her, I think the more plates I make, the less I like my work. And she thought that was kind of funny. And I said, no, I, I, I'm honest about that. And I, I really think um, that it, it's true. And, and that's reassuring because it, it maybe it's telling me that my standard's changing. So um, the more plates I make, the harder it is for me to find that perfect plate. Um, it's been said that you do not take a wet plate. It is given to you. And that's very, um, very important. Um, I specialize in portraits, okay, 99% of every wet plate I've ever made is a portrait. It has human eyes in it. And why I do that is, uh, for me, because uh, you're thinking 200 years from now, um, you ask those questions when you see, you see this gentleman. I don't know who this gentleman is, but you ask, who, where is he, when was it? You ask all these questions because it's a person, you can relate to it. It's that human condition that we're all drawn to. And that's why um, I take portraits versus, um, you know, taking a, a picture of a tree or something 200 years from now, it's still a conifer. Um, it's what's important is, uh, you know, leaving a record of who we are, okay? It's really important. We don't want to become that forgotten century. Um, wet plating is not easy, it's not convenient, but that's not the point. The point is it's difficult and it's a challenge and that's what I love about it. When we slow down, we take the time, the rewards can be very amazing, okay? I'm now composing, while well, you compose wet plates, it takes me 20 minutes with this camera and my chemicals to make one picture. You guys are gonna get to see that tonight. You get to compose, you get to sit there. It's a dance between myself as the photographer and the sitter, and it's that dance that can be very, very rewarding. Um, I have a good friend here, Corey Carson, in the room tonight. He's taking some photographs behind the scenes for me. He's using his digital camera and he's snapping these photographs and I'm not even involved. He's taking them right now and I don't even know that he's doing it. That's the beautiful thing about the technology that he's using with his digital camera. That's not the case with the wet plate. You have to be involved and, it, and it's rather fun. Um, in closing, um, I wanna talk just briefly about um, my health, specifically the, the eye, my eyesight and my left eye. Um, right coincidentally, around the time that I found photography, I developed a macular hole in my left eye. So I have this blind spot. And if I cover up my right eye, it's very evident. But if my right eye is in play, which it always is, um, I'm not, I don't see this deficit whatsoever. But it can be kind of unnerving for someone who's just now found his sight again um, to have this. Two weeks ago, I was sitting at my desk at my office and this crack appeared in my vision in my left eye. Um, I went to the doctor and um, within two days of that, I'm looking through an entire shattered kind of piece of glass. It feels to me like I'm looking through a black, uh, like my glasses were shattered or something. So, and the reason I'm sharing that with you guys tonight 
um, is that I, I want you to know that I, I'm 47 years old and I didn't find wet plate until 44. It took me four decades to actually start seeing things. It's not that I was blind, I always had my vision, but I honestly feel, now as an artist and as doing this, that I never looked at anything before. I never looked intently at anything. And you can say, you, Shane, you have a beautiful wife, which I do, and I have four beautiful children, which I do. Did you never look at them? And I did look at them. But my point is I don't think I ever saw them, okay? So if I can, t t uh, you know, so please, as a person who took over four decades to figure this out, never take anything for granted, enjoy every day, open your eyes and really start to look at the beautiful things around you. I promise you, if you do, like me, your vision will be stored and your life will be enriched because of it. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. You're welcome. You know, you're uh, amazing with the work that you're doing. Tell us a little bit about your historical society, Prince, what you're doing there. Um, about a month or so ago, I, I came up with the idea of actually taking some... Um, Orlando Scott Goff was a previous wet plate photographer here in the state, and he actually took the very first photograph of Sitting Bull. You guys probably don't know this. I'm probably the only one. He took the very first photograph of Sitting Bull here um, on Main Street, uh, right across from um, Zimmerman's Liquidation Center. There's the Blockhouse Building. On the second floor, Sitting Bull came in to um, Bismarck, and Orlando Scott Goff in 1872 took the very first photograph of Sitting Bull here. So I had this idea that I would, I would love to kind of rekindle that. So I'm, uh, I proposed to the Historical Society that I make 50 large 8x10 black glass amber types. I have one out in the lobby if you guys want to take a look at one of them um, for the Historical Society. And I just think it would be a, a, a fabulous collection if we could get 50 of these Native Americans from the Northern Plains and take these pictures of these people and um, kind of uh, pay homage back to not only the people but uh, Orlando Scott Goff. That is awesome. One other thing, because I, I shared this with you early when you were going through here. Tell us a little bit about your gas mask series. Tell me a little bit about what inspired that and where you're at to date on that. Okay. Um, that was really early on when I first started taking wet plate, wet plating. Um, I had this gas mask and I sat my brother again. He was, he's been, he was my, my first subject for the longest time. And I put this gas mask on him and I wilted this flower and it was kind of bent over, and um, he was sitting there looking at this flower and it, with his gas mask on, it's wilted, and I took this wet plate of him, and I called it the, the last flower. I got the idea that if I, what if I took this mask, and there's about a thousand of us, and it's a small community, but the, we all know each other online. If I take this mask and I send it to one of my friends, and they use it in a prop, and within about two weeks, I had 175 wet platers from around the world sign up for my series. I'm, presently the curator of the largest wet plate collaboration in the history of mankind. And I have 35 masks circling the globe as I speak right now, going out to all over the world, and these different photographers are using my mask. That's the key. You have to use the one mask. And it's challenging everyone. Everyone looks at the mask and uses it in a different way. And as we got, we're about 60 plates into this. It's about an eight, nine year project. Um, as we get into this, uh, everyone's challenged because they see all the previous work, and now they have to try to find something new. So. That is incredible. One last question, how has wet plating changed your life? Well, I think I, I touched on a little bit tonight in my speech is that I, I really feel that I look at things intently. Slow down, let's just look at things intently. And I think if you do, you're gonna notice some things. We were just so busy in our lives. It, I mean, I live my professional life online and people, it is a crazy fast world. And this has really kind of given me a different perspective. Everyone, one more time for Shane Balkowitz. Thank you so much.